members, the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor. City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, 28th of May 2019. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. The red light to my right indicates that the meeting is being filmed and streamed. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, belief and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who may be present today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Members and public, will all present stand in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country at sea, on land and in the air. Okay. Welcome members. Uh, we have no apologies or leave of absence tonight. Um, I would seek from item six a confirmation of the minutes, uh, noting that there has been an amendment as on the screen. If I could have someone move the Thank you, Councillor Sims. And a seconder, Councillor Ho. Uh, all those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Uh, deputations. We have one deputation tonight from Mr. Daniel Cohn. Uh, who is giving us a deputation on the Adelaide Archery Club building extension. Thank you. You have five minutes, Mr Cain. Thanks for the opportunity to present on behalf of Adelaide Archery Club. I'm Daniel Cowan, the president of the club at the moment. For over 70 years, our club's been in Park 10 and we've cared for it in the beautiful Adelaide parklands. We're lucky to have these parklands around our city, and in particular having an archery facility that close to the city centre is the envy of other states. I've had interstate visitors come around, and they're astonished to see what we have there. Now, archery is an Olympic sport, as many of you would know, and our club does our part to support that. For example, last week we had several members of the High Performance Program training at our club, and they'll continue to do that over the next few weeks in preparation for next month's World Championships being held in the Netherlands, which is a qualifying event for the Olympics. Now, both our club and the sport has grown over recent years, and we need to expand to meet that growth. Now, a few months ago, we presented our concept for a 20% expansion to the Adelaide Parklands Authority, and it was supported at that time. Last week, an updated proposal with more details was discussed at the committee, and that was also supported. This is a result of about a year's work between the club and the council staff to ensure the proposal would meet the guidelines set by the council. And I think we've met them. 
The current building has been well maintained over the years, but it's fair to say that you would describe it as practical and inoffensive from the outside. Inside over is a different story. It's got to fit out the user's space surprisingly well. Over the years, we've built special purpose cupboards, storage, racks, mountings. We've got a collection of historic archery equipment displayed in the club room as well. Everything has a place, except we've run out of it. The latest concept that our architects came up with has been arrived at through consultation with the council's architect and provides a compliant toilet area with accessible space on the inside and a stylish extension. Coupled with, a, coupled with a refreshed exterior, I think, as does your architect, that we've proposed a very aesthetic and modern looking design. As a final point, as the club will be committing tens of thousands of dollars to this project, we'd like to know we'll be getting value for money. So I ask that the council consider granting us a longer lease. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Members, that takes us to item eight. There are no petitions this evening. Item nine, which is recommendations of the committee. Uh, item 9.1, which is the uh, Adelaide Archery Club. Thank you, Councillor Hyde, a seconder. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak to it? Reserve my right. Okay. No, members? No, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Hyde to summer. Thank you. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, there is 9.2. There is no advice uh, that has been distributed this evening from the Adelaide Parklands Authority. Uh, item 10 is uh, a short report from me. I should say, uh, buona sera. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our Deputy Lord Mayor Hassam Abiyad for taking up the role as Acting Lord Mayor uh, for the time that I was on leave uh, and for attending events on my behalf. And these included powering customer service with artificial intelligence business session, the precinct open forum. Uh, he met with the UK Consul General Chris Holtby, presented awards at the Property Council of South Australia Gala Dinner and attended the Legion of Honour Ceremony in the Council Chambers. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor, for your time while I was away. Um, prior to my departure, uh, I attended the domestic violence vigil at the Space Theatre at the Adelaide Festival Centre after the weather forced us to relocate from Elder Park. Um, it was, a, it was a, a beautiful um, vigil. I think they did it incredibly well. Um, and again, just confirmed and reiterated that no one is responsible for violence used against them and that the impact of violence on a person's physical, emotion and mental well-being is profound and that we must do everything we can to stop domestic and family violence and that it is everybody's responsibility. The International Women's Forum recently held a symposium in Adelaide where I gave the opening address. I spoke about the importance of equality as a path to equity for aspiring women leaders in their chosen uh, life path. It was a great gathering of women that came to Adelaide for that uh, forum. It was also my honour to be invited to address the recent graduates of the University of Adelaide ceremony in Benathan Hall, uh, where I hope I encourage them to think big and uh, to apply their new knowledge to tackling the important issues uh, that will impact all of our futures. A special council meeting and civic reception was held to celebrate the anniversary of Colonel Light's birthday. And following the attacks in Sri Lanka, uh, I met with faith leaders and official representatives of the Adelaide Sri Lankan community at the Town Hall and took the opportunity to express our sympathies on behalf of the city and offer our support. Last week was National Volunteers Week and I would also like to take the opportunity to recognise and thank the more than nine, uh, 290 volunteers who assist us through our community programs and initiatives from the City of Adelaide. I also wish to thank the thousands of volunteers that give service to the community throughout the year. Um, members, I'll also draw your attention to the fact that this week is National Reconciliation Week. Uh, an opportunity to reflect on the history of our First Nations people and the importance of the journey that we're on to reconciliation. And I hope you'll join me in a few weeks for the NADOC celebrations as well. 
Um, finally, I'd like to recognise the City of Adelaide's local government management challenge team came third out of 108, oh, 118. That was a bit of an exaggeration. So, how about 18 teams at the recent state competition? And I'd also like to acknowledge Daniel Portlock, our Civic Events Coordinator, who was awarded the Local Government Trainee of the Year at the recent Maxima Dinner, Gala Dinner and Awards. So, they were great. Uh, that's all I have. Could I have someone accept my report, please? Thank you, Councillor Sim. Second to Councillor Abraham today. Thank you. Those in favour? Thank you. It's passed. That takes us to item 11.1 uh, reports from council members. Could I have someone move? Thank you, Councillor Martin. A seconder? Councillor Moran. Uh, Yes, sorry, CEO, would just like to make a comment? Yes, through you, Chair, just a, a point of correction. On page nine, the chart for meet, member meeting attendance is, is incorrect in that the Lord Mayor took leave and was not an apology. So if I okay, I'll just undertake to correct that record. Thank you. Uh, are there any other comments on the council members? Um, look, briefly, Lord Mayor, uh, because it's such an important matter, I was pleased to represent you um, last week at the announcement of the Dunstan Foundation Hutt Street Centre Connections Week, um, when it was revealed that the Adelaide uh, Zero Project, of which we're proud supporters, has offered housing to 161 people in the, uh, the past year since the uh, a functional zero project has been going. Um, but the sad news, and I think uh, members should know, is that uh, rough sleeping on the streets of Adelaide has actually increased. It's gone from a measured 141, 43, I think it was, uh, last year, to 227 uh, on Connections Night uh, last week, which means there's been a one-third increase in rough sleeping on the streets of Adelaide and in the parklands over the uh, uh, the past year. Um, uh, the, the Foundation remains uh, committed to introducing Functional Zero and uh, wish to record its gratitude to Council for its participation uh, in the project. Um, and just one final matter, I represented the Council also at the Adelaide Airport's Consolidated Committee um, and as I usually do, I should record that there were 970 aircraft movements over North Adelaide and Glenelg during the curfew period between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. for the three months January to March. That's about 10 a night. Thank you, Councillor Martin, and thank you for attending the Connections Week uh, on my behalf. Uh, members, if there's no other comments to that report, I'll ask Councillor Martin to sum up. Thank you, members. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. That takes us to item 12.1, which is the Adelaide Botanic High School Council. Uh, members, we are looking to do those <coughs> procedural first. So if we can actually have a member move. Thank you, Councillor Martin and seconder. Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Martin, did you wish to speak to that at all? No. Uh, members, if we can actually approve the appointment, those in favour? So this is just the procedural, so it's just to approve before we do the nominations. So those in favour? Thank you. Those against? Thank you. That is carried. I uh, will now ask for nominations from members. Councillor Martin? Um, I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims, do you accept the nomination? Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Councillor Abraham today? I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Kouros. Councillor Kouros, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Yes. Are there any other nominations? No, members, there have been two nominations. For one position, we'll have to go to a ballot. A ballot. Okay. The nominees are Councillor Sims and Councillor Kouros. Please mark one only.
Uh, thank you, members. Uh, Councillor Sims is the successful nominee. Councillor Sims, uh, congratulations. Thank you. So we just need a motion to accept uh, that. If I could have a motion. Thank you, Councillor Abraham. Today, seconder. Sorry, all the hands went up. Uh, Councillor Martin. Uh, those in favour. Those against, that's carried. Congratulations. Um, item 12.2 is the Library Boards of South Australia. Uh, the same thing, we actually need to do the procedural to approve. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor, and a seconder, Councillor Canole. Uh, members, those in favour? Those against, that's carried. Uh, now I'll call for nominations. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I wish to nominate Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin, do you accept the nomination? I do. Yes. Oh, three hands. Councillor Knoll. I uh, wish to uh, nominate Councillor Donovan. Councillor Donovan, do you accept the nomination? And Councillor Abraham today? I'd like to nominate Councillor Kouros. Councillor Kouros, do you accept the nomination? Are there any other further nominations? Now, we still have to go to ballot because there are two. We can put forward two names that go to the LGA, then the LGA selects the names that go forward. So it's not an automatic um, appointment to the board. It's, uh, it still goes through the process at the LGA. So on this one, you have to mark two on the ballot forms, two crosses. The nominees are Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan, or Councillor Kouros. Please mark one, two. Sorry, Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan and Councillor Kouros. You can select two. Crosses, yeah. Wait, sorry. Sorry, Lord Mayor, just so I can be clear. Are we doing one, two? Or no, we, you no? just put two crosses. Two crosses. Because we, put four, we can put forward two oh, nominations. Of course, right. So yes. just any two, two crosses on either of the three names. Yes, Councillor Martin. Just a quick question, Lord Mayor. There is remuneration associated with this position. I know it's only a recommendation to the LGA, but should those who are likely to benefit be in the room? Uh, it's only when we've done the ballot and then we approve that, that the persons that are successful in the ballot need to leave the room.
We have two nominees, which are Councillor Donovan and Councillor Kouros. Um, if I could ask Councillors Donovan and Kouros to leave the room, please. Uh, members, could I have a mover that that be accepted? Thank you, Councillor Moran, and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Abraham uh, Any? Oh, we don't need to actually. It's just, sorry. Those in favour? Thank you. Those against? That is carried. <laughs> Members, that takes us to item 12.3, which is the progress of motions by elected members. If I could have someone move the report. Thank you, Councillor Sims. And a seconder, Councillor Martin. Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to it at all? Councillor Martin, members? Councillor Sims? Summed up. Summed up. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, item 13, questions on notice. I have none. Uh, item 14. Questions without notice, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. A question for the administration. Has there been any impact on attendance and the overall income of the Aquatic Centre since the recent media stories on the potential relocation of the Adelaide Football Club, the Crows, to the site of a demolished Adelaide Aquatic Centre? CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, that's some advice I can take during the week, and I'm happy to provide that to Council uh, as I receive it. Um, but sitting here right now, I don't have that advice with me. Um, I have two further questions. I'm uh, happy to receive the CEO's advice in respect of those. Um, how many contractors and service providers are engaged by the Adelaide Aquatic Centre? Um, Councillor Martin, I would think that's a question on notice. I did try and put it on notice, uh, uh, Lord Mayor, and it was declined, and uh, I understand that these questions are acceptable to the administration. CEO? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, there was a series of questions put. Um, they were rejected. They've been amended by the sounds of things, um, and so it's really a determination as to whether they're time-sensitive or not. I'm happy for the matter to be taken on notice. Thank you. We'll take that matter on notice. Thank you, CEO. And the third question is, um, will contractors and service providers be included in any consultation related to any relocation of the crows to the site of the Adelaide Aquatic Centre? It will take them on notice as well. So the answers to those three questions will be distributed during the week. Thank you. And they won't be confidential. Thank you. Councillor Abraham today. A uh, quick question. Um, will there be a, a meeting structure review brought into Council? And if so, do we have an approximate time frame? Um, thank you. Just I'll hand to the CEO. But uh, as promised, I did actually say we'd try the structure that we're in with committees for the first six months. Um, CEO, when we're having a look at that. <coughs> yeah, through Lord Mayor, the administration has been looking at our meeting structure and process and so we had anticipated within the next council meeting or thereafter shortly thereafter to to provide a bit of a summary as to what we got to and 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 seek any adjustments as needed could i request then we have that before the end of june can do. so that we can start the new structure from the first of july yes great thank you members are there any other questions without notice that takes us to Questions on notice, 15.1, Councillor Sims. 
notice. Sorry, motion's on notice. Thank you. Oh, Thank it's you, Lord. Jet lag. It's jet lag. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I uh, move that council requested administration investigate options for atmospheric lighting, similar to that on Rundle Street, for O'Connell Street, and Melbourne Street in North Adelaide, with prioritisation given to solar options. And I seek a second. Councillor Moran. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I won't talk for long on uh, this motion because it is fairly self-evident. Um, the genesis for this was a discussion I had with um, the president of the North Adelaide Precinct Association, um, who said to me that for some time now, indeed years, I understand it, um, the uh, local businesses uh, through the Precinct Association have been advocating for atmospheric lighting on O'Connell Street and on Melbourne Street as a way of uh, making the um, area more attractive um, for visitors, creating a bit of a buzz. Um, and uh, really, this is a motion to get some costings done so that council can make a decision around that. Um, I've put in there the example of Rundle Street because, of course, that's a, a great example of this being done effectively. Um, and uh, there's some beautiful festival lighting on Rundle Street. And so this would be really to get some options together for council to consider uh, in a similar vein. I noted administration's comments around the master planning process. The intention for this, if this motion is carried, would be for a proposal to come back to us with some options rather than this being lost in the uh, quagmire of the master planning process. Um, I do worry that um, you know, this council does have a track record of whenever there's a proposal to do something relatively minor, whether it be footpaths over in um, uh, uh, over in one part of the city or, you know, lighting, there's a, an effort to try and um, wind it into a master planning process. It'd be great if we could just do this now. Um, I know there's been discussion around, you know, this being potentially part of Splash Adelaide. Splash Adelaide is a great initiative, but it's not for infrastructure like lighting, it's for events and activation. So I'd really like to see um, some options come back to council for consideration and let's make this happen. I think it'd be a great innovation for that part of uh, our city. It would make North Adelaide a more attractive and inviting place and um, be a real boost for businesses. So I'm hoping everybody can um, get behind this motion. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Members? Councillor Kouros. As much as I agree that uh, North Adelaide could use um, some lighting and in the streets of Melbourne Street and O'Connell Street, um, the, the whole purpose of bringing the Splash 2.0 into the budget is for that to happen. And so what my thinking was with all of that is that putting that in place with the budget, Splash 2.10 will be, uh, once implemented, we'll be able to activate the streets and know where to put the lighting um, and know where we can bring people to the streets and where we can position everything. And what I understand um, that um, it'd be poor planning for us if we just go ahead now and just say, let's just put lighting up wherever we think that there is lighting is required. I think that we need to incorporate that where we know where activation is going to take place. I spoke to the president of uh, the association as well, and I explained to her that I, the whole reason for pushing forward for the Splash Chip on Foot Splash pro Program is the initiative is to activate the streets, but it's also to actually know how we can actually position the public realm. It's really important that we know that and we do this correctly within this activation program. And with that comes lighting. It, with that comes um, also um, artwork, uh, public art. With that comes a whole lot of other things, not just the lighting for the street. So I would like to say that we are already going towards down that path where we are after the budget going to begin implementing the program for lighting and amongst a lot of other things. Because when you look at when you look at including putting lighting in the street, you've got to look at the buildings, you've got to look at the where the power out where the power is, you've got to look where you're going to put um, 
position everything. And if you look at our common streets across almost like four lanes, you just can't put lighting right across as they do in Rundle Street. It needs actually something more. And what that would look like would all depend on what we activate in those streets. And I think it's really important that we get it right and just not plonk light lighting there. We've got to make sure that we've got a plan in place. And with that will come in the end master planning with what is um, successfully activated in Melbourne Street and O'Connell Street. Through Lord Mayor, could I just make Certainly. just a point of clarification? I might ask Claire Mockler just to clarify what exactly Splash 2.0 is and whether it does incorporate lighting and other things. So thanks, Claire. Uh, thank you. Through the presiding member, um, we'll shortly be bringing a workshop to council um, in response to um, previous motion to um, share with um, this council the work um, that was delivered through the previous splash program. Um, and as part of that, we've also um, got some, um, uh, we'd like some feedback from you around what splash 2.0 could look like and what it could fund. And just to clarify, um, un under the existing uh, splash program um, infrastructure um, such as lighting wasn't funded. So the, the lighting um, in the East End, for example, I think was funded through existing um, lighting budgets in the infrastructure program. So just to be clear, but um, we'll shortly have that workshop with you um, and you'll be able to then um, give us feedback on, on what you'd like to see delivered um, as part of Splash 2.0. So just so, I, Mary, is that a question? So I just want to I just want to be clear. It doesn't mean that just because they didn't use it in the other splash program, we can start implementing lighting and other <coughs> things that we think that will be benefit to North Adelaide within the next workshop. Well, that would be subject to um, council's feedback through the workshop, and then obviously some clarification in the chamber in terms of direction. So, yeah, that will be up to members to help uh, shape that for us. So with doing that, we can fast track it. If or we can just get this done. We can just do it now. Yeah. Councillor yeah, look, Moran. Speak, there seems to be a, an enormous a misunderstanding from the new members, or some new members, about what Splash was. Lighting is not included in Splash. If you included lighting, you'd use your whole Splash budget. As uh, um, Lord Mayor Vershaw knows well, because she took a great interest in Splash and helped um, Peter Smith, I think, at the time to do it. It's nothing to do with lighting and infrastructure, and you wouldn't want a burden with that. It's about pop-ups, it's about parties, it's about um, ephemeral things that come and go. Lighting is an infrastructure. Uh, I've never heard such a long-winded way of saying, no, I don't want to do anything. A master plan is something that we is always on the horizon. We never actually get to the master plan. And it is a very, it's, it's puerile to say, well, this isn't, this motion is ad hoc, is unplanned. <laughs> this motion is a carefully crafted motion um, asking the administration to investigate options for atmospheric lighting. I too have spoken to the trader because all the North Adelaide councillors based represent the business businesses as well as the resident. And I believe Ms. Kuros has been going around saying she's the only one that represents businesses. I can assure you of 23 years of going to all the business meetings and knowing all the traders and business owners I know, and they want atmospheric lighting. It will not come out of Splash Adelaide. If you wait for the master plan, we will all be in the next, some of us that might survive the next term will be here and might see the beginning of it. What a master plan does is set out a roadmap and then you go to that and say, well, I've got enough money to do the lighting component. I've got enough money to do that. So you don't put things in the wrong place. Now, you can't put lighting in the wrong place. We, we've done it in Rundle Street. It's not brain surgery. I urge Team Adelaide to put aside the factionalism and vote for what is a very sensible motion. I couldn't believe when this council um, and Ms. Cross voted, argued against a trader's car park on the La Corneau site. I, I lost all faith in logical yeah, thinking. Council Miranda and thank goodness we got moment. that. But do not do that again. The traders really want this. It's a cheap and cheerful thing to do. It's worked in other areas. Splash Adelaide does not accommodate infrastructural lighting. I have Councillor Kira, then Councillor Martin, then Councillor Andrew Hemsley. Uh, well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, um, I, my thoughts are that this is a, uh, it, it's actually, you know, it's a really quite benign 
uh, proposal. I am all for anything that, uh, that helps our main streets, uh, given how parlous the state of the economy is right now. Um, so um, I just really have a question uh, to the administration, and, and, and that is, realistically, uh, does this motion represent a, a substantial fast tracking? Uh, so we've got uh, September 2019 for discussion and feedback uh, in terms of uh, atmospheric lighting. And, and um, if I can, well, actually, if I can, if I, if I can augment the question to, to, to say, uh, you know, can you give us some insight into the extent to which this will fast track uh, lighting that may be that may be useful uh, for traders on on O'Connell Street, and can you can you give us some insight into the cost uh, that this may be? Um, will this be just a simple one-page report? Here are the options. This is what you do in Ronald Street. Uh, this is what you can do on O'Connell Street, and, and here is the benefit. So I. I Seeking some guidance, uh, basically. CEO. That's really all, Look, I would think that this proposal or this concept could easily be incorporated into the lighting strategy, which is currently underway. Um, it will be reported to council fairly soon. Um, so I think that is quite feasible and it wouldn't be a delay in my view. It's not like a master plan, which is a longer term project. This is just a lighting strategy we're work working on currently and we'll be reporting to you fairly soon. The costs of these two projects, I think are largely gonna be determined by what we end up putting in place. Maybe Clinton, you could, you could provide a bit of a commentary on that too, thanks. Thanks CEO, through you Lord Mayor. Um, the master plans offer us the opportunity to incorporate some uh, lighting investigations early on in the master plan, which we can fast track. Um, some of the work that we would need to do, um, councillor, is to investigate the actual um, suitability of lighting. Um, things that come to mind are the width of the street, the access to buildings, fixing the lightings, the access to power supply. So they're some of the things that we just need to investigate. Um, once we're informed further on that, we could determine the costs of such lighting, but at this time, it's too hard to, uh, to pinpoint exactly what that cost would be. Well, well, well thank you for that, uh, CEO and Clinton. Uh, look, um, it, let, let's be clear. Uh, is what you're saying that, are you saying that <coughs> investigating this now will present a doubling of the cost uh, or no, 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 no I'm, I'm arguing entirely the counter of what you think I'm arguing, Councillor Sims, um, is what, is it, because I'm trying to get clear. Uh, if it is not a doubling, if, if investigating this now means we save the money on it, I mean, if that is something you're going to do as a matter of course, as part of the master plan, uh, which I think is coming, again, September 2019, uh, if this proposal uh, means that that work will be done now, then is that not, is there, is, is that not a zero, essentially a zero cost proposal that we're facing. It's real, but certainly it's not a repetition, so it's not a doubling of cost. It would be something that we could factor in um, if we wish to. So, yeah, hope that answers the question. Uh, Councillor Martin and Councillor Abreen today. Yeah, thank you. And look, I, I, uh, I thank the administration for clearing that up because I have been aware that there is a misunderstanding about what Splash is. It's not about capital works, never has been. And it was a very successful program. I endorsed it. I thought it was great and I'm pleased to see it come back. But look, let's, let's just cut through all the mustard here. This is simply asking the administration to investigate options for lighting for O'Connell Street because the Business Association wants it. That's all it is. Now, the master plan can continue to exist and the strategy on lighting can continue to go on its merry way until it's presented to us, ultimately debated in the chamber and determined. This is quite separate. It is a request from the business association. A business association and businesses generally, by the way, who are a bit displeased with this council, they see us as a, a bunch of do-nothings. That is, we are not doing anything with 88 O'Connell Street. There are no buildings there. We're talking about. Can I? Sorry, no sorry, Councillor Councillor Martin. We are doing things with Adio Connell. We're, we're going through a process at the moment to and do a development. That's exactly what they're saying. They don't want. They don't want activation. They want it finished. And in your absence, Lord Mayor, the Deputy Lord Mayor, the Acting Lord Mayor, informed us all, uh, and it's been widely reported throughout North Adelaide. Anyone who thinks that there'll be anything there before 2022 is dreaming. Now that is exactly the circumstance. Can we, can we debate the lighting, please, Councillor? 
Oh, I am, Lord Mayor. Uh, before you interjected, I was saying to you that there are people in North Adelaide businesses who are feeling mightily disenchanted with this council because of 88, uh, because of other things that have not happened, including addressing this issue of lighting. And frankly, when I was uh, 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 in office in the Precinct Association as the president in about 2000, and in fact, it might have been 19 and something, but we were then arguing for this kind of motion, that is for street lighting. It is not a big deal. The member is simply saying, administration, could you please go away and have a look at this thing that the traders really want? And if we can't give them that, then no wonder they're saying we're a do-nothing council. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Abraham Zidane. Um, quick question off uh, administration. Um, will this motion be a uh, part of the master plan process? Through you, Lord Mayor. I consider that this would be part of the lighting strategy, not necessarily the master planning process, because the lighting, the master planning process is a long term, as Councillor Moreno said, is a long term um, approach to um, the future of, of those streets. Uh, the lighting strategy is a strategy that will apply across the council area, and this could be part of that. That's what I was trying to say earlier. This could be a, a key part of that. Could be one of the first items that is progressed through the strategy. Um, or not, depending on how you feel. Um, well, then, um, will, uh, would, would Councillor Sims take a, uh, a suggestion variation from me? No, it's pretty basic. I mean, it's, it's for an investigation. Well, then, um, uh, am I able to propose an amendment? Uh, yes, purely, you can. Purely to add the, the words as, as part of the master plan process. No, um, it's the lighting strategy. Lighting strategy. Or the master planning. No, the master it? plan process. Just told you it's not. It's not. The administration just said. Well, I'm going to put that amendment forward. Oh, there you go. I'll ask for a seconder. Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Um, the reason why I uh, um, uh, I think this would probably be a better way of uh, going about this motion is um, because Councillor Moran did mention that you know we do have a master plan and uh, it is a uh, it is a document that tells us what we're going to do there. So uh, essentially, in any uh, um, uh, any sort of process, you've got to document what you want to do. Whether if you're building a house, whether if you're upgrading a public road, whatever the, the project is. You've got to document it first. You've got to know which way you're headed and then uh, go on that journey. I think uh, bringing this as part of the master plan uh, would be a better way going forward because we do need to do a lot of planning, whether if it's infrastructure planning or whatever the, uh, the issue might be. I think uh, we're better off uh, to go at once and to do it right rather than going in there fiddling around, not getting it right or uh, whatever the issue might be. So uh, I think uh, this would be a better approach uh, uh, to this motion. Than I urge members to support this. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, there's two there's two sort of fundamental ideas that I'm supporting this amendment on. Um, the first one is that this is actually a wonderful idea, and I commend Councillor Sims for bringing it to the chamber. Um, of course, we all want to see atmospheric lighting in, in our precincts and what have you. Um, but at the same time, the other idea is that age-old complaint we always get at council, which is, you've just done this wonderful job here. Why have you gone and ripped it all up again at massive cost to ratepayers? And that is what I worry will happen if we go and push ahead with this now, then have a master planning process complete with uh, full adjustment to the public realm potentially, at which point your atmospheric lighting is now lighting somewhere that is not activated, is not a space that's going to be used in the same way. I just, I just think it's poor planning. I think it's poor governance. Um, and it reeks of everything that that local government gets wrong, which is ad hoc, um, unplanned uh, decisions made um, on the fly, drafted on the back of a napkin. And it's, I'm sure it was a wonderful conversation you had with the precinct. And it's a great idea. And, it, and I commend you for bringing it to the chamber. And I hope the administration will take it if they haven't already, because I'm sure they've been looking at this in the master planning process. But they'll take it and they'll include it in there. 
But like I said, it just reeks of everything that's wrong with local government. Going over things again and again, not getting it right the first time, needing to go back, rip it up, fix it up, at huge cost to ratepayers. So that's why I would support this amendment. Councillor Moran, then Councillor Sims. Well, I think we've just had an example of everything that's wrong with local government from uh, Councillor Hyde there. Um, as uh, I find his comments um, extremely offensive, uh, written on the back of an envelope, ad hoc, poor planning, nice conversation, um, and all this from a, from a South Ward councillor. Nothing to do with you. Stay in your lane. But this isn't a poorly planned motion. This is a motion asking the count. The, a poorly planned motion was tomorrow string up a few fairy lights across uh, O'Connell Street. That would be a poorly planned motion. What people really hate about local government is exactly what just came out of Councillor Hyde's mouth. Let's do nothing. Let's wait till the master plan. What a wonderful idea, Councillor Sims. I bet you loved hearing that. How fantastically clever you are. Can we I speak actually to the motion, want the, the atmospheric lights. I don't think I'm in that room. I'm telling you what a wonderful person is. Um, we, we all love the atmospheric lights. We think the traders should get free car parking, but I'm not going to vote for it because you represent Members, can everything. we speak to the motion and the amendment before us, please? Well, I am, because basically attacking this amendment on means it's not going to happen because a master plan is a slow, laborious event. Um, by the time the master plan comes into fruition, we probably will have to replace the decorative lights because they'll be so old. They'll need replacing. But um, when we have talked about master planning these two streets, decorative lights, atmospheric lights have always been part of the pre-master plan debate. But don't wait for the master plan. If we wait for master plans, we waited for 50 years to do Victoria Square up, waiting for the master plan. Then we finally shot our bolt and did stage two first, never touched it again. Master plans are an easy way to avoid doing anything. And that is what's wrong with local government. Councillor Sims. Thanks, uh, Lord Mayor. You know, hope springs eternal for me on this council. I did think when I put forward a fairly straightforward motion about lighting and getting some costings done, that my colleagues would maybe, you know, see merit in what I was proposing. But unfortunately, um, it seems some people are reverting to type again tonight. Um, and this is really, really disappointing. I mean, I don't know what we're arguing about, quite frankly. All I'm asking for is let's get some costings done come back to council and then determine whether we want to do anything rather than kick it off down the uh, down the road into the never never of the master plan there's a pattern here and um, you know a little while ago uh, now i came to this council with a proposal around some immediate issues on Hindley street uh, that needed to be addressed minor things were raised with me by um, the local precinct association what did we get a master plan and a pledge to do something sometime off in the never never and I still can't get some basic funding for pavers. It's really petty, quite frankly, um, if people are not even willing to just agree to a simple motion like this. Um, I find it very, very disappointing and I urge the visionless naysayers that are holding this council hostage to get out of the way and let some of us get some things done. Because, you know, members of the community are getting sick to death of this. Councillor Hyde has talked about his frustration around local government. I can tell you what people in the community are frustrated by is this sort of petty politics, the sort of pathetic factionalism that means that a basic proposal like getting some quotes done for lighting is opposed. It's really, really disappointing. I'd encourage members, rather than voting for this amendment, to go with the original motion and, um, you know, to quote a, a Liberal Party slogan of old, let's turn on the lights. Um, I'm quoting a Liberal Party slogan because maybe that will uh, finally um, carry some support from Team Adelaide because it seems anything I suggest is dismissed along partisan lines. It's very disappointing and I expect better from this council. You know, in my mind, um, Lord Mayor, mines are like parachutes and they only work when they're open. And I really encourage members of this council to come to this chamber with an open mind and to actually consider issues on their merits rather than talking about how they can stymie progress on a basic thing like getting quotes on some lighting. I mean, really. Councillor Kerrin. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, uh, I'm, 
I really, I have sympathies on both sides of the argument here. Um, you do, uh, you do sometimes feel like feel like you should get a special buzzer uh, that you can press when you hear the word master plan. You can just sort of go, um, <laughs> because it, but at the same time, at the same time, uh, ultimately this is about efficiencies. Uh, this is about doing things properly. So the argument that we should defer, the master plan is imminent. Uh, the, the argument that we should defer to that is actually completely viable. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a rush to personalize all of this, there's a rush to factionalize all of this. Um, perhaps perhaps we ought, ought to be a little bit dispassionate. Um, and in that regard, uh, my, uh, uh, I have a question, and uh, that question, sorry, administration, um, is, is this variation, uh, is this variation basically a, a redundant variation? Uh, was this going to be looked at as part of the, um, <clears throat> dare I say it, master plan? Or uh, are we actually fast? Because I think what this boils down to is, are we fast tracking something? Uh, and the reason I say this is this is a benign motion is, you know, it just says it just says uh, what are the options? Are presumably involved in those options are what are the costs? It doesn't. Uh, I don't think it takes a huge amount of skin to for, for us to get that in advance. But the question is, um, is this a redundant motion? Uh, or are we effectively fast tracking something by uh, disregarding this, uh, the, the variation that is? CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor. I guess this motion to me clarifies the intent of Council that it wants to see atmospheric lighting a key factor in the master planning process. So I, is it redundant? I don't believe it's redundant. I uh, have Councillor Canole and Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, just a question is first of uh, the administration. Um, what sort of time frame, okay, because they call it part of the master plan, what, it, how does that delay our time frame around the lighting? I mean, if, we, if we're saying that lighting is, is something we want to do quickly as part of the master plan, you would look at that component of that uh, in the early stages. So what is a, a time frame that you would call that, uh, you know, that it would delay some immediate uh, action? See ya. Three, Lord Mayor. We have funding in this coming year's budget to undertake the master planning process. I might refer to Clinton who will be leading those projects. Through the Lord Mayor, um, subject to um, approval of the IBP where that funding is um, secured uh, for the master plans, the lighting uh, investigations can be done as the early works part of that master planning process. And I, I could see that happening in the first couple of months of um, the next financial year. So um, it could progress fairly quickly. Thank you. I had Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Just to um, make a couple of comments with this regard. Look, master planning process don't have to be slow. Uh, Rondell Moore uh, master planning process to locking in a budget to inception, engagement and delivery was a total of two to three years. $35 million project, significant project for the city, 63 anchor points uh, for continuary lighting system that required engaging with significant rate payers uh, in the precinct because we obviously don't own the buildings, we've got to anchor to those points and we've got to engage through that process. So it doesn't necessarily always end up with nothing. Uh, there's been every bit of intent from this council to deliver on other master plans and sometimes it's been council and sometimes it's been our administration that have been competent to deliver on some of those outcomes. Uh, most importantly, uh, there's been councillors here, such as myself in the previous term and ones before us for 20 years, uh, that haven't been able to deliver on some of those outcomes either. I mean, you know, I would, I would argue that O'Connell Street and Melbourne Street would be a much better place if they were represented by people in the community that can deliver on those outcomes and they haven't been delivered. Oh, definitely, Lord um, Mayor, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, why is this dealt with now, not in 1995, for example? Can you please talk yeah. through so, the amendment, um, please, Deputy Lord Mayor? Look, there's something called effectiveness and something that's called just talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's really important to acknowledge. It's getting more like a parliament every day. Yeah, so Members? That's, that's the important bit that I want to really note. Part of a master planning process, we'll have an opportunity through a workshop where we sit down and reimagine this street, reimagine the area, work out what the assets look like, what benches look like, what a footpath looks like, what the future planning of the precinct looks like, the type of budget we want to attach to a project when we're trying to deliver it, how we're going to engage our rate payers through the process. This is just one box we're ticking on continuary lighting system. I don't even know how you would run continuary lighting system on Connell Street 
just watching it through Rundle Street has been a, an interesting challenge to say the least. Um, so it will be a challenge and it needs to go through a process. I think the problem I've got with the original motion uh, is the fact that Councillor Sims does know there's a process that goes in play with this. There is no harm in seeing this come as part of the master planning process and it's our job to make sure that the master planning process happens quickly and effectively and we need to keep putting the administration on notice to deliver that outcome. If we think it's going to take too long, that's a problem. We need to push our administration to make sure we deliver it earlier. The other thing that I've got a problem with is I've heard very clear conflicting advice tonight from administration. I've had the CEO say to us to consider this as part of a lighting strategy. And then I've also heard from Clinton saying that this could be in the, this could be considered as part of the initial stages of the master planning process. So if this can be considered in the, master, in the initial stages of the master planning process, CEO, then make it the first point of action and make it, then it becomes, as we've heard before, a benign motion, a benign amendment, because in essence, it will be delivered as part of a master planning process. So that's one thing that I want to know clearly from my administration in forming a question. Will this lighting, um, we would, if I could seek another minute. Uh, Councillor Moran, please be respectful. Show of hands. You don't have to. To ask the question, thank you, you may have you. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, just a question to administration, will this be considered uh, as part of the initial stages of the master planning process? And if that is the case, not it won't be considered independently, um, when will we see something like this come back to council for us to consider? See you. I think um, Clinton's already described the fact that we will deal with this in the first quarter of the new financial year. Um, we would look to continually have workshops with council as the project progresses. So that's probably the best way I can answer it. So we would deal with it first. And it will be part of the master planning process that we're starting as a council. Yeah, perfect. Mm, that's great. Some nods there. Thank you very much. Councillor Donovan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think overall this is an exciting opportunity and the thing that I hear from everyone is that there's a keenness to get it done. So whether it's through Splash or whether it's through the master plan or whether it's as, as its own separate entity, when I saw this motion the thing that came to mind for me was that we have Ben Baxter, amazing Mr Vivid, on our council as part of our administration team who will be able to support this and make it happen. So we have an amazing uh, lighting designer who is part of our council team who will be able to instigate this in whatever format it, 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 it chooses to or, or whatever we agree to as council. So I think the essence that we get from, from everyone in the room is that let's do this, let's get it done. Um, in terms of the master planning process, I'm reluctant to support the amendment simply because I know from Whitmore Square that this is a lengthy process. Um, you know, just going through the consultation process, by the time we look at what's possible, we look at the consultation process, these things take many years. I think I didn't quite hear De Deputy Lord Mayor, I believe, said three years for the 35 million. Did you say? <laughs> three years for the 35 million um, project, which is incredible for such a large project, but um, at the same time, that is, you know, three years down the track which is very worthwhile if we're looking at significant changes and certainly something that we that should be considered. The good thing with lighting is that it can be very quickly, um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be major infrastructure. So we can look at what's possible in the short term at the same time as looking at what's possible in the longer term. So my inclination is to support the initial motion rather than the, rather than the amendment because the intention is to get something happening in the short term, which doesn't necessarily have to involve all of the infrastructure on the streets. Um, so uh, I think we should look at that initial intention, the fact that the traders are asking for action now. At the same time, we can be thinking about the broader picture and looking at the master plan and what we can do in the long term, which might be the more costly uh, outcomes. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Uh, members, if not, I'll go back to the move on the amendment. Councillor Abraham, today. Lord Mayor, um, given that uh, this has generated some interest and some heat, I would just like to uh, um, say that uh, uh, this, this motion brought in by Councillor Sims is a, is a good motion. Uh, I just felt like it needed a little bit of, a, a bit of an adjustment. Um, but uh, uh, Lord Mayor, there was a discussion around um, you know, getting quotes for lighting and, and I 
understand that I, I get it. Um, and I'd just like to use this as an example. You want to go build a house, and a house is a $200,000 investment. What do you do? What's the first thing that you do? You get some drawings done, you get some documentation done. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to take the right steps. We want to put that master plan in. We want to make sure we know where we're headed and then go and get it. That's that's essentially what I'm, what I'm trying to do with this amendment. So again, the motion is a good motion and I'm all for it, but I just felt like it needed a bit of adjustment. Thank you. Uh, members, go to the vote. Those in favour of the amendment? Those against? If I could ask you to put your hands up clearly, those in favour, those against, so that is lost, we go back to the substantive, uh, to the original, sorry, the original motion. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone that hasn't spoken, but if anyone would like to speak. To the original, you can ask a question, Councillor Crooks. Yes. Okay, I just want to um, ask a question in regards to because um, I spoke to the administration in regards to what is in place in regarding um, placing at, at the lighting in the streets, and because Melbourne Street and O'Connor Street are quite uh, large streets and. Uh, wide roads, etc., especially O'Connell Street. Um, they did say to me that they would work internally with the Splash 2.0 to, um, to make sure that the investigations are complementary to the Splash program. So this is why I brought this up, and this is why I'm pushing to, with it, because I understand that Melbourne Street and O'Connell Street are screaming for some lighting, but I want it to work complementary with the Splash program. I don't want to have lighting somewhere and then you know we've got an activation somewhere else and there's no lighting there. I want it to work together. So can we amend that to, is uh, Councillor Sims happy to amend that to add that in there? Or we, we could ask the administration to take it as an undertaking, perhaps. Okay. Would we be happy with that? Yes, yeah, CEO? Yeah. Okay. Um, I might just speak before we wrap up. Um, I agree with Councillor Donovan. Everybody is in furious agreement. It's really about timing and the process because we have a motion for an immediate action. We have a lighting strategy coming through in September and then we've got a longer term master plan. And I do understand that those, those precinct groups are looking for things to happen now, which is the whole point of Splash 2.0 that Councillor Kouros has, has uh, put forward, uh, that we actually increase that budget so we know that we can actually have a proper activation program. We do need to make sure that we marry up with our activations, with our infrastructure, with our forward planning, with everything that happens, otherwise it's going to be a complete mess. However, having said that and knowing that this will take a little while for us to actually get an investigation, understanding that the, the CEO and administration have undertaken to make sure that it marries up with whatever we're going to do. I'm sure if we're going to do an investigation, it has to be part of the lighting strategy and any lighting strategy has to be passed a part of the master plan. Um, I would ask members uh, to support this motion of Councillor Sims. Thank you. Councillor Sims to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor, for your um, comments. Look, it took us a little while, but I think um, I think we're uh, getting there now. Um, look, I've got no problem in terms of uh, this being linked up with, with other strategies. My concern was that if this just gets lost in a broader uh, master planning process, um, that we would find ourselves in five years' time saying, you know, we're still waiting for the house to be built, to use um, Councillor um, Amar uh, Abrahimsida's uh, analogy. Um, and given, you know, businesses have been talking about this for a long time, I don't think it's much to ask to say, let's get a few options and bring it back to council so that we can consider. Um, so uh, I appreciate uh, members' support um, for this. Um, and I really look forward to um, seeing O'Connell Street uh, and uh, Melbourne Street lit up in a way similar to um, Rundle Street. I think that's a really beautiful part of the city and it'd be great to see some of that uh, vibrancy um, brought down to North Adelaide. I think that would be a real boost for businesses um, and attract more people to the area. Members, if we can vote. Those in favour? 
Those against, that is carried. Councillors, the division has been called on the motion. Those in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Abraham today, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Carer, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Kuros, Councillor Martin, Councillor Canole and Councillor Sims. Thank you. Uh, members, we'll now go to 15.2. Uh, Councillor Moran. Um, while you're away, Lord Mayor, um, Council Sims moved that we um, set up a, a record of um, dealings with developers. Um, oh, sorry, I'll move the motion. That's printed. <laughs> yes. If um, I could have a seconder, please. Thanks, Councillor Sims. It was defeated as some people felt that uh, the current convention was adequate. Um, I think my experience last term and during the elections, I think it was a very sensible thing to do and many councillors are adopting such a thing. But there was some nervousness among some councillors for having their um, for having that recorded. Um, and I felt that that was unfair on the people that wanted to um, have, be open and transparent about their meetings and dealings and reasons for meetings and dealings with um, developers. It was a very heated debate last time, which implied that we were calling developers demons, devils, and demonic people. We're not. But of course, we deal with developers a lot, um, not just in assessment. We've got two enormous developments uh, coming up. And um, as the councillors that live and work in the electorate, we come across them in our daily business, often only to talk about daily business. Um, I was accused last time of dealing with a developer um, for reasons that I couldn't understand. I would have appreciated a, um, a record of that and the reasons for my meetings um, for transparency. I think this is not an onerous thing for people to do, it's a safeguard. And it's also something that the public would like to see who's meeting who and you know you often see muttering oh so and so is meeting so and so and what were they talking about that if let's put it on the record so anyway i've moved removed the word mandatory from um councillor sims to put voluntary now as i was asked by councillor care before well, can't we just do that ourselves on our facebook and things like that but i think i would like the council to do it because i would like everybody eventually to do that themselves so it's of course, we can say that I met with Mr. Askenathus last week to talk about the Hutt Street Centre. I can do that. But I think that if councillors that really understand what, what was being proposed last time do it, I think eventually the other councillors will see that it's not the bogeyman that it was presented at, at last council meeting. It's actually something that, um, that helps councillor and breeds trust and transparency with the community. So if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But I would like the CEO to, to have a, allow us to, to put that on the record. Otherwise, I'll just do it in council reports anyway. But if we do it more officially as of putting this motion up, I think that will give it the imprimatur of um, legitimacy by the administration. That would help the other councillors. I think a good council, we would all be on that record. At the moment, there's some councillors that have severe reservations. L let them stay off it then if they want to. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, yes, as Councillor um, Moran has said, you, you missed an interesting uh, meeting when um, this was discussed uh, a few weeks ago. Um, look, obviously, uh, a mandatory uh, disclosure regime is um, what I uh, proposed, um, but that was uh, very narrowly defeated by the Council. And so I think what Councillor Moran has put forward is the next um, best thing, because it gives those of us who uh, welcome that level of transparency the opportunity to put any meetings that we have, uh, any contact that we have on the um, public record. And those who want to meet in secrecy behind closed doors can continue to do that. They're not being compelled um, to uh, provide any of that um, information if they don't wish to do so. Um, I would, uh, through you, Lord Mayor, you know, urge um, my council colleagues 
um, to uh, be respectful when conducting this debate. Um, some of us are still scarred after the last meeting when um, you know I was sort of dragged through the mud for daring to suggest more transparency. I hope that members are a little bit kinder to Councillor Moran um, when they uh, talk about um, this uh, motion tonight. Um, I think, uh, as Councillor Moran has said, um, we could simply uh, declare at the start of the meeting the, um, uh, the contact that we've had with, with developers um, in a, a public meeting and do it that way. But it would be good um, for there to be a uniform approach um, among all councillors, those of us that welcome this level of transparency. And uh, I think um, having uh, something on the website, I'd encourage, uh, encourage administration to think about that if this motion is passed. Something on the website with this information. So those of us that, that want to be on the public record about the contact that we're having can do so. Those who want the meetings behind closed doors and want to maintain the veil of secrecy can do so. Um, and they're not being um, compelled to, uh, to step into the sunlight um, and, uh, and be exposed for the meetings that they have. But don't punish those of us that do welcome that level of transparency. Don't prevent us from um, being on the public record um, about such matters. So I encourage all councillors to support this. Members, Councillor Kerry. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Mayor. Um, I, I just, well, really, I'd like to just pose a question. I'm a bit iffy about this one. So, I, I, a question which uh, the mover with Councillor Moran has uh, sort of answered, I suppose, and the, the question, you know, um, about why it is. Uh, but, but I'll put the question out there because um, I, I'd, I'd invite uh, Councillor Moran and anyone else to address uh, this element, which I think is, is fairly central. Why? What is it that's currently stopping uh, individuals who are running for elections uh, from simply uh, putting forward a record of who they, you know, um, who they engage, who they, they conduct the filthy tango uh, with when they meet with, you know, Satan's slaves or whatever. Um, uh, you know, what, what, what's stopping, what's stopping uh, members from doing that individually? Um, I've heard mention of essentially there's sort of a council in it's centralised, but uh, that, that's the query I've got. Um, we, because this is voluntary, we can all do this anyway. So that, that, that's, the, that's the query I've got. So. Who are you directing the question at, Councillor? Not to administration. Uh, I'm putting it out there, Lord Mayor, because uh, I, I think it would it would aid the debate. It would certainly aid my vote. Uh, so I'm putting this out there, particularly to the to the mover of the motion, uh, but to any, anyone else, because that's the thing that I'm not convinced about. Should I explain my motion? Perhaps when you sum up, Councillor Moran, Councillor Hyde. Um, just to answer, answer Councillor Kira's question, um, I would say there is nothing stopping those who wanted to put this information out there from putting it out there. Um, absolutely nothing at all. But I would, I would say the risk of going forward with this is exactly what Councillor Sims was referring to when we're talking about kindness and such things. And I would say kindness begets kindness and violence begets violence. But um, I would say when, when Councillor Sims was talking about this matter, he rather a little smirk on his face referred to uh, people who want to meet in secrecy, people who want to meet behind closed doors, and so so the implication is, council, to Councillor Kira's point, that if you're not on this voluntary disclosure uh, register, then you are meeting in secret, you are meeting behind closed doors. You're up to no good. So so for me, I mean, I'm I'm not um, a retired grandparent. With, with, with lots of time on my hands. Um, for example, I'm not someone who is doing this as a hobby. What I am is someone who is a young professional working a full-time job. I don't have time to fill out this voluntary register. I don't have time to, 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 to detail the many conversations I have, not just with developers, but with other business owners. Um, and so I think it, it disadvantages me, it disadvantages other very busy councillors who, who will not be able to fulfil the, the, to the, this register to the same standard that other councillors might want to pour into it, not because they necessarily believe, necessarily believe in it, but because they're trying to imply that other councillors are meeting in secrecy and being dishonest. That's what I've gathered from the debate here. 
um, in the chamber, and that's why I, I can't support Lord this. Lord Mayor, that is certainly not what's been implied. Thank you. Councillor Moran, you'll get a chance to respond in a minute. Councillors, Deputy Lord Mayor. I just want to say a quick uh, comment. And members, can we keep our comments to the motion, please, sure. and not make them personal? I don't want to turn into Judge Judy. So if we can please just keep our comments to the business at hand, it would be most appreciated. Otherwise, I'll have a gavel here next week. Um, the fact this item was dealt with at the last council meeting and council did not endorse the motion presented to it, and this is a voluntary one. And part of the reason to why council, or my vote, to why I didn't support this at the last council meeting, I, I did have the, uh, I did have, uh, are you the Lord Mayor? Would you like to be the Lord Mayor? Members, well, members, yeah. members, the Deputy Lord day. Mayor is speaking. It's my time to speak. Um, Councillor Moran, <laughs> please. So, very simple. Uh, the reason I didn't support it at the last council meeting is because it had a resource associated with it and a cost associated with it to our council and to our administration that I'm not prepared to vote on and support merely because the fact remains that currently we have something known as a perceived conflict, an actual conflict and a material conflict that every single councillor have to, must, must must at every council meeting disclose when an item is presented, be it in public or in confidence, on the minutes of the council. That is your contact with every rate plan. You could be issuing out a lease to a hospitality business. You must declare a conflict. You must. You might be removing parking, which we're going to have to be dealing with later, parking tickets from the street. You have to declare a conflict or a benefit, a perceived benefit. It doesn't stop at developers. They are rate payers in the city. They build this city. Commercial properties contribute 80% of the rates of the city. We cannot demonise these people, which is being done. It is being done exactly right. Because I don't know many developers that are going to be very comfortable having their names on websites and doing business with council. That's not how business in the real world works, where people have jobs and make money and employ hundreds of people in this city. This is not how you treat your ratepayers, especially when there are rules and laws in place right now. Three things to remember every single time. Perceived conflict, material conflict, actual conflict. Go to sleep with that every night. Come to this chamber with it every day and remember it. That is what that is. Stop wasting time. Councillors. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, uh, I do hope that you do it because the level of personal abuse here in this chamber for the last couple of weeks from Team Adelaide has oh. been appalling. Point of order, um, well, Lord Mayor, there was actual abuse on both sides. So, you know. Mary. Members, members, can we just stop right there? We are talking to the motion and nothing but the motion. Well, I'm happy to do that so long as the abuse stops. Thank you. I Councillor Martin, speak can we speak to the motion? Thank you. Oh. Oh. Deputy Lord Mayor, we are speaking to the motion. This is the sort of behaviour Thank you. That's going Please, on while you're away. I will adjourn the chamber, chamber if you do not stop immediately and talk to the motion and nothing else. Members, we will take a short recess. We'll be back in five minutes. Thank you.
Thank you, members. We can all take a deep breath before we start again. Uh, I think Councillor Martin is no longer there. Councillor Moran is no longer here. <laughs> Councillor Martin. Uh, sorry, Lord Mayor, I was um, uh, comforting Councillor Moran. Um, look, uh, Lord Mayor, I, uh, I was going to talk uh, about why this is necessary, but look, frankly, if the Team Adelaide members don't get it, there's just no point. There's just no point in my standing here speaking. It, we are a dysfunctional council. We are dysfunctional. Hmm. Councillor, any councillors wish to speak further? If not, I'll go to Councillor Moran to sum up. I'm not suggesting any great cost to council, um, as uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor, as he likes to refer to, um, said. It's just something on the website. Uh, I'm not demonising developers. Um, there are developers in this room. I admire their work. Uh, I'm very good friends with some very prominent developers. They saw no problem in this at all. The, the, the cloud of nefarious meetings behind closed doors, they don't want that either. They don't want um, the suspicion that they're doing something untoward. If you don't want to be on it, don't be on it. Um, I have never said that just because you're not on it, you are obviously doing something wrong. So don't put words in this motion's mouth that we're not intended. Um, yes, as, as Jesse said, we could easily put it on our own Facebook, but it looks a bit odd if you sort of pop up and say, well, I've done this and I've done that. Then you sort of think, why is she, why is she only, you know, why is she saying that? Is she doing something peculiar? It's much better to do as other councillors have, have done. It costs nothing to put it on our website. It, it takes a second to um, send an email to the Lord Mayor. I don't know how busy um, Councillor Hyde is, but I gather he was referring to me as the retired grandparent. Um, I too am busy, um, but I'd find the time to do that because I take my job on council very, very seriously. And for 90% of the time I was working as well as being on council and I still would have found the time to do it. Um, I don't want to get into mine, the, the way this has been twisted. It is a simple thing to do. It's mandatory. Other councils do it. And I tell you what, I wasn't suspicious before this debate, but I am a bit suspicious now. Thank you. Members, those in favour? Those against? Division. Division. Councillors, the division has been called on the motion. Those in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Kara, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sims. Thank you, members. We now go to item 15.3, Councillor Kerra. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Actually, may I say at the outset, welcome back, Lord Mayor. It's good to have you back. Thank you, uh, And I have no doubt that you are uh, thrilled uh, to return to public, uh, public duties. Um, so I, I move as printed and uh, I seek a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Thank you. Um, look, um, Lord Mayor, this, uh, uh, as we would all be aware, this was a motion uh, first put forward by Councillor Moran. Um, and it was done so initially as, uh, as, as, a, as an amendment, not a formal motion on notice, uh, and it was then withdrawn. Uh, I'm bringing this back, Lord Mayor, very happily uh, because, because I believe uh, very much uh, in, in, in the motion and in, 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 in my view, uh, the, the benefits outweighing uh, the negatives. And 
may I say two members, because uh, whilst we had a, a bit of a discussion about this last time, and there were some uh, there were some concerns raised by members. May I say to members that this motion is different. Uh, there is a fundamental difference, or oh, well, there's a very substantial difference, and that is the, the addition of clause two. Uh, and clause two uh, in this motion basically says that uh, if the projected uh, rates revenue for any uh, upcoming year, if that rates revenue is to fall below uh, the base year, which is current year 2019 20, uh, and of course a record rate uh, revenue of $108 million. If that number is to fall below, then there is a safety net. This does not apply. Okay, so um, I hope that members uh, consider that that one big concern they may have had before has been addressed. Um, the broader, the broader question about rates is something we have got to deal with and confront right now. Um, there is a very serious economic situation, situation out there. Uh, it, all of us are keenly aware of the extent of vacancies across the city. It is bad and it is just unfortunately getting worse. I've seen it spread from uh, uh, along, um, uh, along um, Hutt Street, uh, from the South Ward, which Councillor Hyde is keenly aware of, it is now spreading north, okay, with all the banks moving out. Now, we have got to acknowledge that there is a fundamental role we play in this, and increasing rates is not going to help. It will make things worse. It is, unfortunately, a fact of life. Uh, it is part of the economic equation that if you want businesses to come into the city, if you want businesses to flourish, you what you've got to do when everything else is equal, when people, when you don't have the numbers of people coming in, you've got to lower the cost base. And these are very dry economic terms, you know, economic cost base, whatever, but let's just, let's keep in mind the ultimate outcome of this. There are humane outcomes involved. There are humane outcomes. When you, uh, when you, uh, lower the cost base, when you encourage businesses to flourish, you create, if I may have 30 seconds more, thank you, you create you create jobs. And when you create jobs, Lord Mayor, you cut down, you you, you prevent the the, the, uh, the rise in uh, all of the bad things that happen on unemployment, domestic violence, uh, suicide, depression, the whole bit. So there are humane outcomes at the end of these dry, uh, dry discussions about economics, and about uh, about the cost base. So, I humbly submit to councillors: we can do this. Keep in mind, uh, keep in mind, this does not stop us. This does not stop us from uh, uh, retrieving further funds from revenue sources outside of rates. This doesn't prevent it. Uh, all this does is uh, it, it flags our commitment. It would make one heck of a great piece of messaging economically that we are going to commit, given the circumstances in the economy, we are going to commit to four years and not just and not just year by year. That would be a magnificent thing for us to do. We can do this. Councillor Moran. Councillor Sims. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, I can't support uh, this motion, although I, I do uh, respect mm -hmm. Councillor Kira's position on it. He, he has been uh, consistent on this, um, as has Councillor Moran, who's uh, seconded the motion. They have uh, long advocated for uh, rate freezes. It's not a position that, um, that I uh, support. Um, I don't support it for one year. I certainly don't support it for four years. Um, and I've articulated my concerns previously on this council around the impact that that can have in terms of cuts to staff, um, cuts to services, and the impact that that has on uh, the experience of residents and ratepayers in the city. And I say to councillors when they're thinking about this, Lord Mayor, to consider the basics of economics. If you want to fund your priorities, you need to have money in the bank. You need to have money in the kitty to do it. And uh, you know, if you want your free car parking or your handouts for big business, you need to have money in the kitty to do it. Or if you want to have your master plan and all of the time and energy that's spent on that, you need to have money in the kitty to do it. 
Um, you can't fund the priorities of the council without having um, revenue at your disposal. And whilst Councillor Kira points out that um, you know this means that the motion stipulates that uh, if we maintain current revenue, then you know that's okay. But what if we want to actually grow the pie and have more revenue at our disposal, so that we can do some big picture stuff, you know, beyond just your car parking, and actually look to the future and uh, and really you know invest in the future, do some major infrastructure projects, move into that space. I mean, I'd love for us to be able to do some of those things during this term of council, but if we're going to do it, we need to have money in the kitty to fund it. Um, and, you know, I'm not convinced that if we continue to go down this path of, you know, freezing the rate in the dollar, that we're not going to see more and more cuts to staff and to services, and that in turn will have an impact on the experience of people living in the city of Adelaide. I mean, elements of this uh, council meeting tonight have been a horror show, um, but it will be Edward Scissorhands coming back to uh, Town Hall if we go down this path. There will be more cuts, um, and uh, I don't want to see another torturous budget process like the one that we've just had. I want to see us moving beyond just the basics of a council, rates, roads, rubbish, car parking, car parking, car parking, and actually look to the future with some big picture projects and uh, I don't want us to be going through the rest of this council term with one hand tied behind our back, wearing a straight jacket, a self-imposed straight jacket in, uh, imposed by this council. To me, that would be an act of lunacy. And uh, I think we really need to say no to this approach. Uh, Councillor Knoll. Um, just looking through the, the proposal, I also have difficulty uh, in uh, supporting it and it's I suppose sort of the same sort of reasons, but slightly different in a sense. One is that until I know, have a good a, a, a grip of uh, how you know how fiscally we run and uh, uh, and how we you know, the council is performing, until we have explored all the different ways that we can actually um, get income and services that we can provide that uh, people will value, uh, then it's very difficult to put a blanket uh, uh, freeze. Without, uh, without necessarily ri uh, risking uh, letting, uh, having to say down the track, we need to go back and uh, reassess this. Um, saying that, uh, uh, that there's a, a safety net, well, that's quite interesting considering we're setting the rules um, and we're really, in a sense, any, any value increase in the properties, et cetera, will automatically increase the rates, et cetera. So we're in charge. So there isn't any, uh, you know, other than a world collapsing, there isn't any rule why that uh, the, the rates will go backwards uh, to such an extent. So if we look at that and if we, uh, we do it a bit different and say that first as a, as a council, find ways that we can find other ways of re revenue, find savings that we do inherently by, by improving our services and, and also the way we do the services and the technology that's available to us. And uh, when we've done those things, then automatically, we, uh, once we have a clear future, and yes, doing the big projects is important and finding ways to do that, but first of all, let us have a clear path to that because at the minute, you know, we are talking about uh, vacancy rates and all that, and that's really critical. And the lack of, of uh, visitation by, by consumers and, and by, uh, you know, international visitors are a bit different. All these things contribute to our, our problem. If we solve those greater problems, then the problem of our council is uh, is much uh, much easier. And if we think about it, uh, all those things, our our small contribution is uh, with the rates, etc., is certainly not going to sway someone uh, to any significant way. What will sway them is that uh, in the in the in the sum of doing business in Adelaide and in the CBD. Uh, they're going to be more profitable and certainly be able to be more competitive by being here. And that's a, that's a, something that sits around the entire equation of being here in the city, not just uh, our component as rights. And they are set on the value of the properties and success will get you more rights. Thank you. Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I just want to say that I actually I don't support this motion and I had a chat with Councillor Kira in regards to it. We've had a rate freeze for the past five years um, and it hasn't, uh, it's actually the vacancy rates have gotten higher in our city, hasn't changed the fact that we've had more businesses coming into the city. Um, I don't think his analogy is actually um, going to be fruitful in, in, in that way. Um, I do support a rate freeze, but I'd like to be 
I like it to be assessed every budget. I don't think we should set it in stone. I think we should look at the budget every year as we do. Um, and if we can freeze it, great. If we can't, we don't. It depends on what's happening at that time. And I think we need to leave ourselves open for that. Um, and that's why I don't support that. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Kouros. Councillors, Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, um, there certainly has been an outbreak of love in the chamber, Lord Mayor. I never thought I'd hear uh, Councillor Canole. Are we talking us. to the motion? Yes, I Councillor, am. Councillor, I, I, could, I can happily have another cup of tea. It's no, 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 it's all right. I, I'm saying I never thought I would hear them agreeing on a subject, but yes. they are. All right, mind. could you please talk to the motion, Councillor? I, well, my next word was, but I can't agree with it. <laughs> I can't agree with it. Uh, rates revenue uh, comes from two sources. It's pretty simple, uh, and I do understand that Councillor Canole uh, isn't familiar with the processes entirely, but it comes from valuations which are done by the Valuer General, uh, and those valuations rise, they can fall, but by God, I've never seen a year in which they have fallen. That generally is the driver for rate revenue for this council. The second, and we have no control over that, by the way, that is set by the Valuer General. The second uh, means by which we receive revenue is the rate in the dollar, which is set by the council. This council, for five years, that's correct, five years, has said, no, we're not going to use that double taxing mechanism as so many other councils do. And indeed, I've read with uh, some interest in recent weeks, councils boasting all over Adelaide that we've held our rate increase to 3% or 2% or 5% um, when in fact what they're doing is double taxing their residents and businesses. This motion is a commitment to the ratepayers of Adelaide that we are going to apply a discipline to ourselves to ensure that the rate in the dollar is not increased and that the only increase that occurs in, uh, in income through rates uh, for this council is through valuations and of course through new developments as and when they occur. It's a pretty straightforward commitment to give and frankly I think given that this council has given that assurance to ratepayers for the last five years to not be prepared to give it would be I think a bit suspicious. In fact I think our ratepayers would smell around. Moreover there is uh, an additional incentive. Uh, the current uh, government, uh, and in fact uh, Councillor Canole's son, has announced that there will be a Productivity Commission Councillor inquiry. Councillor Martin, yes. could you please stick to the motion? I am. I, I, which part of what I said do you object to? Councillor Canole's son, that's what you well, I, I, can I'm we, not, Councillor Martin, I'm just continue, can we I'm just, can we, I'd like to actually get out of here at some point tonight. Could we please stick to the business in front of us without anybody making comments about anybody else in the chamber? Full stop. Well, I, Thank you, Councillor Martin. Don't do well, the innocent I, face. I know you know you I'm, know what you're doing, so please just I'm continue. I'm sorry, Lord Mayor. It, it is an innocent Yes, mark. at every single council meeting. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Please continue. Stephen Canol said in, in Daily just over a week ago that because the government's rate capping legislation had failed, there would be a Productivity Commission inquiry, and one of its goals would be to drive enhanced financial accountability in the local government sector. There can be no better guide to our financial accountability than giving an assurance to ratepayers that we will commit to holding the rate in the dollar to the same zero level for the course of this term. That's exactly what the government is looking for, that's the way in which we can be a shining light for local government in South Australia. And I urge members to support that. It seems to me a sensible, reasonable thing for this council to do. Members, sorry, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, look, I speak against this um, and mainly on Mainly on one reason why I'm in its process to be able to deal with this yearly. Um, I've, we've supported rate freezes before in the past and I don't have a problem with that. And there are actually five ways in which this council picks up revenue. Um, there is a, as we've heard before, the two, which is the rate valuation, 
and the new rates discussion. There's also the increase in the rate of the dollar. There's council business, uh, which is important, and then there's efficiencies. And those five things have got to work hand in hand, and they've got to be assessed annually by us in a budget process to be able to make a determination to how we're faring uh, with that process, depending also on our expenditure. We don't know what surprises are going to hit us uh, next year. We might not see, uh, we may see a rate valuation increase. We might also see uh, potentially new rates increase, but we have some catastrophe that we have to manage and we're going to have to affect different rate increases if required. What I'd like to see when we're talking about rate fixing and rate reduction in the dollar is that we start using those council meetings to determine how we generate money in our business. That is how, by increasing non-rateable revenue in this council, we'll be able to reduce the rate in the dollar and keep it down. That's how we deal with it. That will also drive efficiencies within the organisation. That's what I'd like to see us talk more about in future agenda items. And look, like I said, I acknowledge Councillor Akira and Councillor Moran for having pushed this first and before. My main issue with it is process, and I prefer to do these items yearly than to make a political promise for our rate payers that we potentially may not be able to keep. Uh, Councillor Moran, you're summing up? Can I do it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, you did. I know you, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. We look alike. <laughs> not, not I'm sorry, <laughs> Councillor Kerry. Members, would anybody else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Moran. Thank you. You are forgiven, Lord Mayor. <laughs> sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I did actually see Councillor Moran's hand, Councillor Kerry, which is why I went to. <laughs> right. Uh, so look, I think this is a good motion, and um, I think uh, to answer some of the concerns that the Deputy Lord Mayor had. Uh, part two completely wipes that out. If a catastrophe happens, if some unexpected expense happens, um, then number two deals with that. But um, I, I think uh, Councillor Martin got slightly distracted by the interruptions, but Minister Canole has come into power as the minister and said that the raising of the rates in council councils has brought great um, a cloud over local government. The Liberal Party, of which I'm a sympathiser, has made it very clear that if councils don't get their rates under control, he will rate cap. Now, we did cap, uh, stop uh, any rate increases, or well, no, of course, as, as um, Phil said, we're not, we, our rates still go up because we still value each year, but we don't want to double dip. I think it's a fabulous message to send to Minister Canol that we are within normal parameters and, and barring any unexpected events, we intend to keep our rate in the dollar the same. There's nothing wrong with that process. We've done it in previous councils. It is flagging a, in, an intention, a good intention. It can have no negative effect. It doesn't matter, um, Councillor Canole, whether you understand the process or not. You understand enough of it to know that a rate freeze is a good thing. And as to Deputy Lord Mayor's um, assertions that we should be looking at getting our businesses working better, nothing sharpens the administration's mind and the councillor's mind better than a rate freeze. When you let the rates go up, suddenly the, the urge to make the businesses pay for themselves gets a little, you know, not quite so. But you say, we're going to freeze these rates for four years, you'll find that there's a lot more thought put on how to get some more money out of the businesses. Um, the idea that vacancy rates have increased um, so therefore, um, Je Jesse Carer's, Councillor Carer's motion is invalid, is ridiculous. Uh, so we'll just put the rates up there and get more vacancies. I commend Councillor Carer for persevering with this motion, and I urge you to leave the, leave the block voting behind and vote for sensible motions for a change. Thank you. Councillor Carer, to sum up. Definitely, definitely me this time. It's definitely you, okay, gentlemen you, down Mayor. the back. Yeah? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, well, uh, look, where to begin? Uh, Councillor Sims, look, 
you know, I, Councillor Sims, uh, Edward Scissorhands, Lord Mayor, I've got to, I, I will try to, I will defend Edward Scissorhands, Lord Mayor, because that, Edward, Edward Scissorhands, Lord Mayor, was a, uh, was a fun, sort of whimsical fantasy movie. But if you listen to Councillor Sims, you think it's some kind of horror movie. You know, you know, I mean, seriously, you know, all gonna boogie the, yeah, here he comes, here he comes cutting, uh, for, for heaven's sakes. The numbers speak for themselves. $104 million going up to $108 million this year. Every year, a, 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 a rate climate record, Lord Mayor, every year a rate climate record. And, uh, you know, um, so the, 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 this kind of fear mongering, uh, heaven's sake. Let's get real. I, I tell you, horror movies, Lord Mayor, horror movies, you know, the chamber, the chamber's become a bit like the exorcist, Lord Mayor. It's Member, become... sorry, Jesse, sorry, oh, Councillor Kerra, can I get you to speak to your motion <laughs> as opposed to uh, and, giving us a film review? Yeah, That'd look, be great. Uh, it's Thank too tempting because I know it's all going down in flames. Um, <laughs> look, um, look, uh, look, and, and the other, the other, the other concern uh, that is being expressed about a, 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 an emergency, uh, whatever, well, that is covered. The number two is a safety net that is covered. It is just rates. It is not uh, uh, all of the ancillary sources of income um, that is being that is being dealt with here. Uh, so we are covered. If there is a sudden shortfall in rates, well, this motion actually protects us from dealing with that. We will be setting in stone a baseline of $108 million uh, uh, each year. It is not that difficult to do this. And I would submit to members that the benefits uh, the benefits very much would outweigh any potential negative. Members, if we can vote. Those in favour? Those against? Division. That is defeated. Councillors, the division has been called on the motion. Those in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Carer, Councillor Martin. Councillors, that takes us to item 15.4, Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm going to withdraw this motion and uh, work on it over the next fortnight with administration. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Noted. That takes us to item 15.5, Councillor Martin. Yes, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Look, this is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, let me preface it by saying that uh, I, and I'm sure everyone in this chamber, congratulates uh, all of those who were successful in uh, uh, Metropolitan Adelaide in the recent federal elections and uh, commiserates um, with uh, those who weren't successful. Um, it, uh, it is always a, a dramatic thing to win or lose a seat. For the past 15 years, the seat of Adelaide... Sorry, I do need a seconder before you... Thank you. The past 15 years, the seat of Adelaide uh, has been held by um, one candidate, uh, Mr. Georgianis. Steve Georgianis is the new member, the first in 15 years. And I think it would be a really good idea um, that you, on our behalf, Lord Mayor, write to him and congratulate him um, and um, uh, try to establish the excellent relationship that this council had with his predecessor. Uh, Kate Ellis. Additionally, the second part of the motion is to invite Mr. Georgianis to address us about his vision and goals uh, for the City of Adelaide. Um, I've got to say to you, I know nothing about Mr. Georgianis uh, other than that he held another seat in Metropolitan Adelaide. Uh, I have no idea what he thinks about how policies are in respect of anything or what he has in mind for the seat of Adelaide when it comes to uh, negotiating policy so far as his party is concerned. And therefore, I think it would be illuminating to invite him to come along and to address us in the same way that many others do uh, and to express his, his hopes and his vision uh, for this city. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I uh, support this motion. Um, uh, like Councillor Martin, I, I congratulate uh, Mr. George Arnes on his uh, election, and I would very much welcome the opportunity to uh, hear from him at a meeting of council. 
Um, we heard from Councillor Martin earlier about the latest figures on homelessness in the city. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate hearing from uh, our local federal member of parliament what plans he has to uh, address the issue and to advocate on our behalf at a national level in terms of looking at additional funding for uh, homelessness, social housing in the city of Adelaide to deal with the, the homelessness crisis that we have. So um, I'd be very interested in, uh, in hearing from him and um, having him come along and address us. Um, members, if I could just say a few words before I uh, go back to the floor. Um, particularly to the new members, it is my role as the Lord Mayor to uh, talk to all of the members, both at state and federal level. Um, I met with uh, Mr Georgiana several times in the lead up when he was a candidate, as with all the other candidates. We did host a candidates forum at breakfast here to hear from those candidates. And my team has already drafted the letter for me to sign on my return to congratulate Mr George Annis, as well as other members that have uh, found seat at a federal level. Um, that is the role of the Lord Mayor. I would also suggest that rather than we uh, invite Mr George Annis to formally address, which is a deputation which doesn't allow us to ask any questions or have a conversation, uh, that if members uh, do wish to meet with Mr George Jones, we can do something uh, more informally that has more value. Uh, very ask, uh, happy to ask him to join us for a dinner or something like that if we wish to get to know him and uh, we wish to actually have a conversation with him uh, about what he's going to represent. Lord Mayor, I'm happy to accept that as a variation. Um, uh, with the approval of my seconder, we can vary that to invite Mr George Arnes. Um, to an informal occasion to meet members who outline his goals for the City of Adelaide. Well, I would probably request that the first part actually is um, not required either, given the letter's already been drafted. Um, well, look, I'm... Um, yeah, the second one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I can vary the first one too. Um, and I maybe informally meet with, because yeah, yeah. it's rather than an address. The council acknowledges the Lord Mayor has written uh, to the new member of the federal seat of Adelaide, Mr. Notes. Steve Georgianis, congratulating him Just on behalf of, and invites Mr. Georgianis as the first member of the electorate since 2004 to informally meet the council. Um, I think that's fine. Uh, and that, that acknowledges the role that you've played, Lord Mayor. Yeah, nice. Notes. The Lord Mayor has written to the new member. Yep, and that reflects exactly what's happened. If, um, that does reflect what's happening. That's yep. fine. Members, uh, seconded. Okay. Uh, well, if we're all in furious agreement, Lord Mayor, I have nothing more to say. Members, if not, I'll go back to the mover to sum up. Okay. Members, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to item 15.6, Councillor Martin. Um, yes, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I have a seconder for this motion, uh, Councillor Moran. Um, but before embarking on this, I wonder if I might ask the CEO to disclose to us the nature of the advice he received and which he communicated at a time when members may not have read CEO. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Martin is referring to an email that I sent out to council members just prior to this meeting. Um, fundamentally, I see my role is to provide you with advice and information. Um, as a result of the email that Councillor Martin sent around, I, I sought some external legal advice just to be clear so we understood precisely what our abilities are and the advice I've provided really just sets that out. Um, so I'm happy to take any further questions on that, but the advice pretty much confirms um, at the moment we have no ability um, to complete a form notifying of our intention to appeal. We literally do appeal or we don't appeal. If we do appeal, there is some potential for costs to be incurred by council, and that's what I needed you to know. That's what I was trying to say. Um, because it is a, a process that we either do or we don't do. We don't notify of an intention. That's the external advice that I've been provided for um, today. We have Brett Carland available to answer anything further that you may have, but I just needed to let you know. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Moran. 
Um, could I ask just a question of clarification there? Um, I too spoke to some lawyers today and it was explained to me, and if this is in line with what you're saying, that there is a close by date which you can flag an appeal after and that's coming up, which is tomorrow, which is tomorrow. So if we don't do anything, we have then on one hand removed the ability to appeal and the legal advice, and I admit that it wasn't written, uh, was that what you do is lodge intent to appeal, which leaves the door open for an appeal. If you then decide on further legal advice to not continue, there's no penalty uh, to that. But you have you have put your um, you have it's a bit like that when you tick the box. I'd like to speak at the meeting. You're not compelled to speak at the meeting, but you have not ruled that out. Whereas if we don't do anything by tomorrow, we have ruled it out. Is that right? Um, I might just ask Brett to respond to that. Thanks, Brett. <laughs> We cannot lodge notification of an intent to appeal. If we lodge an appeal, there will be cost implications. If we do not appeal, we will forfeit our right to appeal. There is a 21 day appeal period from the date of the judgment that is ending the date of the judgment, 8th of May, that will end 29th of May. So we have one day to lodge an appeal. There is only one other option available to us, and that is to lodge an appeal out of time and seek to the full court of the Supreme Court permission to extend time. There is no warranty that the full court of the Supreme Court will provide that extension of time. So there is risk with proceeding with that course of action. So as I see it, there are three options available to us. We do not appeal. We lodge an appeal by the due date where we have not obtained a considered legal opinion. If on obtaining a considered legal opinion, the prospects or grounds of success are not good, we may withdraw, but there'll be cost implications as a consequence of withdrawing. If we can get a considered opinion to obtain a barrister or QC at this point in time, that will not be available by the due date. And then we would need to seek subject to that considered opinion and appeal out of time and seek permission from the full court of the Supreme Court. So, Councillor Moran, is that a question? Yeah. For instance, uh, if we went along with the, like we're getting out of time, we don't want to ask for a late thing, we say, okay, we're going to appeal. Um, and then we don't appeal. What are the cost implications of, are we fined for not continuing with an appeal? Or? But that has to be in by tomorrow, doesn't it? It has to be in by tomorrow. So, if we lodge appeal. The cost implications, I don't think are necessarily in the order of a penalty or a fine if we withdraw. Yeah. Um, and obviously, the longer you wait to withdraw, the more that's going to increase. So I couldn't give you any so firm advice on what that cost is. Because... But it's also the cost of the other party, because the full court of the Supreme Court is a full cost jurisdiction. That means if council were to withdraw, we could be ordered to pay the cost of the respondent, St Anne's. So it won't just be the court, it is the cost of the respondent and costs that they may have reasonably incurred up to the date of that withdrawal. That is why it's very difficult for me to give you a figure of, well, if we withdraw after one week of lodging versus two weeks, what will those costs look it's like? It's quite contrary to the advice I got today verbally, that if we withdrew appeal, if we did not proceed with the appeal, St Anne's would have had not to do, had not to do anything to that point. They, costs will only be incurred when we activate the appeal. Is that not the case? I'm, I'm happy to believe you, but it's disappointing. And I don't know why we wait until last minute. I will confirm verbatim the advice that we have received. An appeal is either instituted or it's not. Once instituted, there are cost implications. There are cost implications in withdrawing, i.e. the respondents are entitled to their costs. That is the verbatim legal advice. But withdrawing, could you clarify withdrawing? I mean, obviously, if you started a court case, both okay, you withdrew halfway through it. If you don't actually, if, if your legal advice says you haven't got a chance, which we haven't had time to ascertain, um, if we didn't, if we withdrew a particular time, 
I can't see what, if there's no fine or penalty, what are the cost implications, except for us going to get some legal advice as to see whether it's worth going ahead with it. And the third party's cost in seeking their QC's advice. Councillor Hyde, you were next. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as we sort of wade through this, um, so I've read the judgment. I get, I get that. I understand. I've read Councillor Martin's emails as well. But just for my um, uh, benefit, a couple of things. So we have to have the fundamental, the fundamental legal arguments of what our appeal would be by close of business tomorrow. I'm guessing. <laughs> I agree that one should generally not institute an appeal without considered legal advice. And when appealed to the full court of the Supreme Court, it would be recommended we engage in a senior barrister and QC to give us a fully informed and considered legal opinion. Um, if we were to lodge an appeal by the lodgement date, at best, we would be able to obtain is a principal legal counsel advice. The principal who has supported this case on behalf of counsel would be the best we could do in the short time frame to obtain a ground and basis for appeal and what the reasonable process is. So whatever we could do by tomorrow, that's that's it, and we would have to rely on that legal argument throughout the entirety of the appeal. It could be developed and refined, and we could, in parallel, get some considered legal advice, which may inform a subsequent withdrawal or, proce or to proceed to. Yeah. The um, does the Supreme Court make any particular habit of um, uh, overturning decisions of the ERD? The Supreme Court. <laughs> the, the Supreme Court will only consider, and the grounds and basis for appeal can only be based on an error of fact or an error of law. The Supreme Court will not intervene in the subjective merits of the ERD court's decision around the impact or the protection of the amenity to the residents and the view. That is not a matter they will concern themselves with. If it is established that there are grounds or an error in fact or law, then the matter will be referred back to the ERD court. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that there are other colleges as well in North Adelaide. Uh, is there a risk that this will set any sort of a precedent in the uh, suburb? The legal advice we have received is that this case does not set a precedent. It is unique to its facts and the specific policy and concept plan that applies specifically to St Anne's College appeal. And that, that specific concept plan anticipated a four-storey dwelling. Okay, and I suppose just again for my benefit, the last we're, talk, we're talking about costs, and I can't see anything mentioned in the comment. How much have we spent on this to date? In the ERD court to date, we have spent one hundred and twenty-four thousand dollars. Wow. Okay. Um, members, I'm going to go to Councillor Martin because we haven't got a seconder for the motion yet. Oh, so we've got Councillor Moran. Oh, so you haven't moved the motion yet, so... Yes, I, I, well, I did move the motion, Lord Mayor, and I said that Councillor Moran had seconded it. Councillor Moran raised her hand immediately to ask a question. Sorry, I think it's semantics, but... Uh, okay, okay. so the, amount, the motion is moved. Okay, so uh, members, debate on the motion. No, I have questions, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, look, uh, I understand the advice that uh, the administration received, but I also sought advice this afternoon. One of the residents affected is a senior member of the, the legal fraternity. And additionally, I consulted a senior planning lawyer, in fact, possibly the most senior planning lawyer uh, in Adelaide, who advised me that in such circumstances, it is common practice for a lawyer to lodge an appeal on uh, behalf of a client and at the same time as lodging the appeal to correspond with the other parties and note that the appeal has been lodged to protect the time limit and that a decision on whether to proceed with the appeal proper will be taken by a particular date. Further, it is common practice to note in the letter 
that costs uh, should not be incurred and that no action should taken, be taken by the other party. And if they do take action and seek the same cost, seek to claim costs, then the letter will be presented as evidence to refute the claim. Further, costs are not axiomatic in the South Australian Supreme Court, and they are subject, according to the legal advice, to other considerations, including such matters as uh, <coughs> opportunistic or vexatious claims. Has the administration considered it might be possible to do as that legal advice suggests? Through the CEO, that is in part contradictory with the advice we have received. So no, we have not sought a comparison of the different legal opinions at this time. Well, um, that seems to be two of the opinions uh, that I have. Um, would the administration be prepared to test that? Um, to determine if it is possible. Through you, Lord Mayor, we've taken external legal advice from our solicitors that have been working on this case from the beginning to the end. My view is that is a reasonable avenue to have taken. If council resolves to instruct the administration, then I will carry out that, that requirement. But at this time, I don't see any reason why we would go against the advice we've already received from a solicitor that has been intimately involved in the process from the beginning. So. Okay, um, this uh, four-storey development was uh, presented to our own assessment panel, that is our own experts, uh, and it was rejected. Um, St Anne's appealed to the ERD court and then council vigorously defended the decision of the panel. Why did we do that? Thanks, Shadi, if you can respond. Uh, through the Chair, um, whenever there is an appeal uh, by an applicant, um, Council has no other choice other than to um, represent the views from the decision of the CAP. And was it the view of Council in entering into the ERD court to defend the decision that it was on safe ground? Uh, through the chair, um, council uh, uh, council's cap made the decision. Um, St Anne's College uh, lodged an appeal, um, regardless of what the prospects of uh, of success or otherwise might have been. Uh, council is obliged to attend to the court. Thank you. Whether whether we think we are correct or not. Why wouldn't we just surrender, um, reverse the decision? Uh, through the court process, um, there is a compromise that is presented often. Um, in this instance, the CAP chose not to take the compromise uh, and it was um, defended through the courts. And the CAP chose not to take a compromise because it believed it was right? That is my understanding. Thank you. Okay, look, uh, let me just explain this. This whole saga has its origins in uh, something called the Colleges and Institutions Development Plan Amendment for the City of Adelaide. This is our development plan. Um, it was written in collaboration with this council and the state government and then approved by the Parliament of South Australia. That's what it's all about. Now, uh, throughout much of the last term of council, these amendments were the subject of many council meetings, many committee meetings, many public meetings, and many consultations. Um, it was a particularly passionate cause of the council and of the former Lord Mayor. Um, he wanted to see, as we all agreed to, allow the colleges and institutions to expand within their own areas, subject to conditions that would not see the character of North Adelaide, which is the only part of the city which is called an historic conservation zone, he wanted to see that that was protected. Now, um, uh, one of the uh, concessions made was to uh, allow St Anne's, this college, to expand, not on the site it's proposing, but in the front. And I think we allowed it to go up to five stories. 
Now, um, Lord Mayor Hazy was aware of that design, uh, and uh, he was aware also of St Anne's plan to put four stories there, and so he pursued it with passion. He actually engaged with the government, and I remember well the day he took the minister, John Rao, in a car up to these views and said to the minister, we must protect these views down and up towards the historic heritage listed Uniting Church at all costs. Now, the minister agreed. He could see it, just like the Lord Mayor. And so the parliament amended the development plan I've distributed to you. It says, buildings on Stanley Street, Kingston Terrace and Brougham Place may be constructed to take advantage, blah, 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 blah. But protection of landscape qualities of public and private open space, including avenue and adjacent parklands planning, and vistas to the parklands, to Brougham Place, and the eastern end of Stanley Street should further distinguish the policy area's character. Now, this is really unusual in a development plan. A particular part of the city and the need to preserve it has been mentioned and isolated by the minister, endorsed by the town hall, agreed to by the parliament. That is what is being sought to be overturned by St Anne's. Um, they went to the ERD court because they don't agree with the minister, they don't agree with the former council, they don't agree with the parliament, they want their four-storey building. And even though the ERD concedes, yes, the legislation is going to be breached, it will have an impact. May I have a minute longer? Thank you. Uh, even though it is going to have an impact, even though it's going to be in breach of the law, the court said, well, it's only a little breach. It's not unreasonable. Now, the view of everyone in that area is that, and I hear this in council's assessment panel constantly, the view is that once that vista has some dwelling or building on it, then it is easy for every successive developer, institution or otherwise to say, it's already happened. This view has been compromised. The legislation has been compromised. That is what is an issue here. And not only in that part, that part of the amendment plan, but the whole of the colleges and institutions DPA, which is incorporated into our City of Adelaide development plan. So this is about one institution unwinding the protections that Lord Mayor Hazy and the Parliament sought to give us. And this motion simply asks the administration to lodge the appeal in the terms that the planning advice I have received would allow us, and if it is not successful, to withdraw at the discretion of the CEO. Now look, our residents expect nothing less. This is one of those key battles if we buckle on this, we buckle on the lot. Um, I have Councillor Abraham today, followed by Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, we've just had a conversation about freezing the rates, but uh, yet here we are. Um, we've exhausted all the options in this scenario, but yet we're uh, willing to go um, to go to court and, and spend more money on uh, on legal fees. So how, can we, how are we expected to freeze rates and keep Costco under control when we come, up, when we come across these sort of scenarios? Now, we've, we've exhausted all the options. I don't see us going anywhere else. And I don't know whether if we're able to um, see what sort of cost um, we're looking at if we are to take it to the Supreme Court. Do we have an approximate cost at all? A preliminary pre-estimate. Um, as a general rule, costs will be substantive in the full court of the Supreme Court. It would not be as expensive as the full appeal to the ERD court. Um, a conservative estimate for us to engage a barrister and represent us would be in the rough order of $40,000. Being conservative, it could be upwards. Our experience is that is a conservative estimate that we've been provided. Um, noting that should counsel be unsuccessful, um, we may be ordered to pay the costs of the other party, which could then bring our total cost up to 
double. Thank you. So if, if we're looking at that sort of cost, considering we've already spent $125,000 uh, on, on this issue, I just want to remind members that this is uh, this is where you can all get out of control. So um, um, I urge you all to think about this and the feedback that administration has provided. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, what price do we put on our city's heritage? What price do we put on the uh, historic vista of North Adelaide that would be uh, irreparably damaged if this uh, St Anne's uh, expansion is to go ahead? You know, I uh, agree with Councillor Martin on this because I think this development, if it proceeds, is going to be a Trojan horse for North Adelaide. It opens the way for an attack on our uh, city's unique heritage. And the thing about heritage is once you trash it, you can never, ever get it back. It's gone. Once you lose that historic vista, you can't undo that damage. And uh, that's what really concerns me about this development. And I know that is what really concerns uh, residents and ratepayers in North Adelaide. As Councillor Martin has said, this is not a new, uh, a new issue for Council. It's something that has been a, a long-term uh, focus. And indeed, I've had discussions with residents about this in the past. I know that there is a huge amount of concern and white hot anger in North Adelaide about what is in effect an assault on uh, our city's heritage. Um, so I'm very, very concerned about it. And I think we have an obligation as a council to do everything we can to fight this development tooth and nail. And uh, that means looking at every single option so that we can say hand on heart to our residents and ratepayers, we've done everything we can to go into bat for you and to fight for our city's historic buildings. And um, I'm certainly in there, in the trenches with Councillor Martin on this one. I think it is really, really important. And uh, so I encourage members to support this motion. Members, Councillor Moran, did you wish to speak? Uh, yes, this is a pretty hot topic. Um, I mean, we've been dealing with this situation the, and the institutional zones for a while in North Adelaide. Uh, under the Rao government, we, we really decimated um, the planning rules in North Adelaide, allowing the institutions to um, bleed out of their uh, other what had been hard boundaries. Um, what, what St Anne's done is, is, is difficult to understand. They have a lot of land um, that's not built on. Uh, they have a un totally unused tennis court and the front that faces um, Melbourne Street, we allowed them. We didn't argue with the government at the time that they could put five storeys there. Uh, but they chose to build. Um, they first applied for a four-storey building, Shanty, correct me if I'm wrong. When CAP back in the day said no, uh, you can only have two stories, they've got two stories. And they came back to us and said, well, actually we've built the two story building and it's able to be built to four stories. So they have been dogged in their persistence. Um, I, I think it doesn't need to be repeated. It's been said well before that these things, this is a line in the sand that we must draw. I know the cost of the ad is high, but you know, what cost justice? What cost the um, heritage of, of North Adelaide? I can understand the reticence of some people, but this is something you do spend money on. This is something that you go to the go to the trenches on. It's not just a frivolous little law case or anything like that. I don't agree with the advice that the administration's been given. Um, I also spoke uh, not not no written advice or payment or anything to, to lawyers, and I got the same. Um, advice that uh, Phil Martin did, that you lodge it and you can withdraw it by a certain date, giving us some time to get to get our ducks lined up, ask our lawyers, you know, was there a mistake? The implication that there wasn't a mistake in law, there wasn't a mistake in process, I think there was. I think there was a mistake made uh, by the ERD court, and I think it needs to be rectified. It wasn't a minor incursion into the development plan that they that they said. Uh, it was a major one, and one that even the Rao government said pulled back from. That's how important it is. Those houses along Stanley Street, for people that aren't familiar with North Adelaide, um, are built backwards. 
Um, they are little one story on that, they look like little cottages on the streets, but because they're on the edge of the escarpment, they have gigantic houses facing down the hill. They were built backwards. And as a development planner, when we presented historic um, uh, and heritage documents to the government, we pointed that out. That is a very rare thing to do, to face a, face a building down the hill. Um, we have protected those views. We've fought tooth and nail to keep them protected. And now we've got a chance. We, we've, I mean, it's, it's terrible that it's only tomorrow that we've got it, that we're rushed in here like this. We should have been planning this way ahead. But I think we could lodge you know, a, a notice to appeal and, and then take our time getting some legal advice. It'll cost a bit of money, but I think our ratepayers, all our residential ratepayers would totally agree with us because they've been on the journey with us for, sorry, they've been on the journey with us for all these years. Thank you. Councillor Cruz. Um, I've got, um, I really feel for the, it's, it's two residents that are affected by the views, I'm told. So there's two uh, residents that are being, uh, losing partial views, correct? Is that, is that right? Can I? Um, through the chair, um, there were two residents who um, were joined uh, in the appeal process. Right. Uh, the, the views that are, a bit, are being impacted um, most questionably are by those residents. Um, however, there are other views that um, could potentially be perceived to be impacted um, by other um, occupants in the locality as well. Um, the question about precedent and um, whether this case would create a precedent um, is, um, it should be corrected in that the provisions that relate to St Anne's are specific to St Anne's simply because of the slope of the land. Um, the other institutions in North Adelaide, uh, residential institutions, um, have different provisions uh, by virtue of their geography. Um, and the other thing that should be noted is that um, the provisions around views um, in Stanley Street um, were provisions that pre-existed the changes to um, the St Anne's, uh, uh, the, the DPA, the North Adelaide Institutions and Colleges DPA. So, sorry, can, so do they still exist if they predated the DPA? Um, the provisions around protecting views in that part of the city uh, or North Adelaide um, have been continued through Sorry, Councillor Coates. You know, I've, I've listened to both sides of the arguments and um, as an elected member, it's really, sometimes really difficult to make those decisions. Um, and I'm looking, I'm listening to administration's advice and I'm listening to the advice that, uh, that Councillor Martin received. And I mean, you know, do I base my decision on what Councillor Martin said or do I base my decision on what administration says? And I have to, Sorry, in this case, and I've always been told and by senior councillor members here been quite some time that administration do provide advice and they have resourced the correct advice. So I'm going to have to go with administration here that, you know, we've only got until five o'clock tomorrow. There is no legal argument to proceed. Um, we've exhausted every avenue. Um, we, it doesn't set a precedent. Um, so I, I can't support this motion on the basis of what the, uh, the advice of the administration. Members, if not, I'll go to Councillor Martin to sum up. Look, I can't believe I, what I just heard. It's incredibly disingenuous to read from a type of script saying, I have listened to the argument and reached this conclusion. You need to listen to the argument, not read from the script. The arguments have been cohesive and persuasive. This is an important issue related to precedent. The precedent, once established, will ensure that it's easier for people to say, the view is already compromised, this is merely an extension of that precedent that was established. It's not about two residents, this is about a principle. And the residents of North Adelaide the residents of North Adelaide, I'm making a point, Lord Mayor, not pointing at you. The residents of North Adelaide do have a very strong view about this. Now, uh, 
I've got to say, you need to assure the residents of North Adelaide that there is a North Adelaide in Team Adelaide. And you can do that by supporting what is a very sensible motion. It is to authorise the CEO to launch an appeal. I would suggest within the terms of the legal advice that is possible, that is advising the other party that this is to preserve the date and then to take the advice. And the motion that's there puts it all in the hands of the CEO. Now this claptrap about how much is it gonna to cost to go to the Supreme Court doesn't even arise. It is in the hands of the CEO to determine whether the evidence that is presented to him gives him the confidence to proceed on the reasonable prospect of success based on legal merits and in the context of the costs and risks associated with litigation. Those words have been sitting there through this whole discussion and nobody seems to have taken them in, least of all Councillor Abrahimtada, who's saying, why should we worry about this cost here when we're trying to drive rates down? Indeed, why should we prioritise this? Well, the reason is, this is one of those seminal moments in this council. This is one of those moments when the residents of North Adelaide, when they meet at Verona, when they meet in the North Adelaide Society or any other forum will say, remember the day they let us down. Now we have a chance for very little effort, very little cost to do the right thing by the residents. And if it is the CEO's view, it is not worthwhile, he has the authority to not proceed. It's as simple as that. You either do the right thing or you chicken out now. Please support this motion and then you will have the gratitude and the respect of the people of North Adelaide. Members, those in favour of the motion? Those against? Division. That is lost. Division. Councillors, division has been called on the motion. Those in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sims. Members, that takes us to uh, item number 16, motions without notice. I have one motion without notice, Deputy Lord Mayor. Apologies, uh, Lord Mayor, this is a bit quick one. Um, I'm happy to move um, as printed and seek a seconder, if that's okay, and I'll speak briefly to it. I'm sorry, I'm still Councillor Hyde first. Um, thank you. Look, just in the wake of the uh, budget announcement uh, from the state government, I've been approached by a number of businesses in the city that are having significant concerns around, one, understanding the impact of the increase in licensing fees on their business. Um, and also their business viability. Um, it would be great if the administration can prepare a report uh, detailing to us the number of businesses that are potentially impacted and the type of business operation, as I can, um, from what I understand, uh, is depending on the hours of operation of those businesses, the licensing fees can shift and change. Uh, and potentially after that, we might be able to put something either on their behalf to the state government to be able to mitigate some of that impact or, or be able to try to get some concessions uh, to try to assist them where possible. Um, so that's all I'm asking for, some information if that's possible. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hyde, then I have Councillor Moran, Councillor Sims. Um, yes, it's, uh, this is an excellent motion. I thank um, the Deputy Lord Mayor for bringing it. Um, once again, taking the words right out of my mouth, it is so disappointing. This was, this was something that was missed when um, the increased fees and charges came out the other day in that press conference because uh, on the second page of the attachment to the press release, um, uh, there were all these increases detailed um, for all these different licenses. Now, some things are, are quite modest, uh, small bars and that sort of thing, but, uh, but the hotel the hotel licensing, pubs and clubs and that sort of stuff, it, we're talking huge increases here. And at a time where we as a city are trying to do our best um, to put downward pressure uh, on, their, on the cost of doing business, um, doing things like scrapping out your dining fees and that sort of stuff. Uh, it's incredibly disappointing to see all of our good work being uh, immediately um, and, and very ruthlessly undone um, uh, by the state government here. So I'd urge the chamber to support the motion. Councillor Moran. And I just said, oh, 
Uh, sorry, I have Councillor Sims and Councillor Martin. Thanks, Lord Mayor. This would be the moment normally where someone proposes a master plan or something like that, but <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, I, uh, I support this. Um, I support this motion without amendment. Um, I uh, agree with the Deputy Lord Mayor. This is the um, kind of issue we should look at because um, it does impact on um, our ratepayers. You know, one of the great innovations we've seen in the City of Adelaide um, over the last few years, and certainly under uh, the leadership of Lord Mayor Yarwood in particular, was um, the development of small bars in our city. Um, and that really has, I think, changed the culture of Adelaide and really put Adelaide on the map. You know, often when I was growing up in um, the city of Adelaide, well, I didn't live in Adelaide, but I lived on the outer suburbs of Adelaide. But, you know, the idea of a big night in our city was, you know, a marathon of the bill. Um, and that's really changed um, the last few years. There has been a, a real vibrancy uh, and excitement and buzz about our city. It's generating um, investment in our city and the night economy has really started to develop. And for the state government to take an axe to that, I think is extremely irresponsible. Um, they've talked a lot about you know, growth and jobs and so on in, in their pitch for coming into office. Um, but uh, now what we're seeing is uh, hiking up fees and damaging um, our local businesses and our night economy. So I think it's uh, reckless and disappointing from the state government. Um, and uh, I'm very keen to hear about the impact that this is going to have because um, I'm very, very concerned that we risk um, damaging Adelaide's reputation as a, a vibrant and exciting city. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Martin. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I'm just, uh, I will support this, but I'm struggling to understand uh, what's the intention. Uh, the administration prepares a detailed report on the type of businesses that was detailed in the budget papers, and the businesses impacted that information is available through legal licensing. They will simply tell you the number of licenses. So what, if, what are we going to do with this when we have that information? I mean, the mover must have an idea. Otherwise, you wouldn't ask. I'll leave that to the mover. Members, if not, I'll go back to Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. I might briefly just sort of respond to a couple of the uh, remarks and questions made. Uh, we need to understand the impact of such policy on the businesses in the city and the number of businesses in the city specifically. Uh, and then we're able to group it and potentially talk to the state government to lobby on behalf of businesses to provide concessions or mitigate some of those aspects. Uh, we have been working pretty hard for a long time to be able to activate the night economy in the city. I can understand that the state government's got significant pressures, especially with the GST cuts that were you know, received as a state, and they do have a balance, they have to have to balance the budget. I appreciate that. Uh, but look, just to have this uh, come out of small business, and I know they're potentially trying to you know, curb uh, some of the night economy practices, especially late at night. Maybe that's what they're trying to do. I don't know. But uh, I just think for us, we need to understand the impact it has on the businesses and the number of businesses. And then based on that information, I'm sure there'll be other motions or other questions that I may have um, to put the administration into council to support. Members, if we can go to the vote. Those in favour, those against, that is carried. Are there any other motions without notice, members? If not, uh, there being no confidential reports, I'll close the meeting. Thank you.